Hey guys, it's Biggs the Mad Aquarist. I'm actually out on the road this week, so I thought this is a great time for me to catch up and get a bunch of editing done, get a bunch of videos ready to go. And I noticed that I have a lot of videos that I want to start priming up and getting ready for you guys, but they kind of need a bit of an introduction. Now, when I introduced my channel uh, last weekend, uh, I noticed, I, I mentioned about where I wanted to do, what I wanted to kind of do, some of the topics I want to carry. Now, to dwell into that a little bit deeper, I have the opportunity, I've been very, very fortunate and grateful for the fact that I travel for a living for my job, for my livelihood. And I've had a lot of opportunities with speaking engagements all over, all over the world and stuff like that, that I've met a lot of really, really, really cool people. And... I decided that I'm going to basically do a start doing a series of interviews with a lot of these really, really cool aquarists, scientists, people that I meet all over the place in my travels. It doesn't matter if you're in some small little town, there might be one really cool fish guy there and he might have something really, really cool to offer. And I'm finding that out in a lot of the places that I travel. So I present you a new series that'll be come when they come, but they're going to be all over the place where I will highlight some really world-renowned or maybe some unknowns, but they still have lots of stuff to offer to us. I'm going to call it the Aquatic Masters. So with the Aquatic Masters, this series, this is going to be video number one. And this is going to be a two-part video. So you're going to get number one today and number two when I think you're ready for it. Because this guy is pretty cool. This is a guy that came all the way from Germany, uh, a young guy came from Germany, and uh, he definitely outpartied me because this guy just went nonstop for weeks. And when he, he came all the way from Germany, he made about 12 stops before he ended up in the frozen tundra where I live, and he was with me for almost a week. And this guy's crazy, but he definitely knows his stuff. And this guy should get known worldwide for what he does. His name is Daniel Kahn Vetterlein from Germany. He lives in a small island in northern Germany called Nordenai. And... Uh, he, he, he does some exceptional stuff with fish. Not very cool fish, though. He, he keeps primarily plecos. So if you like plecos and all those pleco sucks and all the mud eaters and the wood eaters and the algae eaters and all that sort of stuff, and you want to study fish that hide all day and eat, come and eat the crap off your glass, good for you. Not my fish. My fish are way cooler than his. But he also likes birds. But we mock him a little bit about the bird thing during the videos. So is what it is. But... Uh, if you like these videos, hit that button up top there, or down there, or maybe it's over there. I don't know, but look for it. Find the button, it says subscribe. And then you can follow this giant weirdo on all his shenanigans and adventures everywhere he goes. And trust me, there's a lot of really weird and cool stuff coming up that I've already got ready to go. Got to get it ended up, make it all pretty for you. But uh, Daniel, well, getting back to Daniel. Daniel is, I guess he's the editor. He's been the editor for a while. He's probably one of the main authors. He's probably definitely the most prolific photographer in fish that I've known in a long, long time. But he's uh, the editor of the IGBSSW. Sounds very fancy. But it's the International Barb, Tetra, Loach, and Catfish Association. International, meaning it's only in his yard, I'm guessing. I don't know, because... There's no cool fish included in that group. You notice cichlids are completely omitted there. How about live bears? What do you got against live bears? I don't even know. Not even killifish, not rainbows, but just barbs, tetras, loaches, and catfish. Those four. And that's it. No more. So, whatever. See where he goes. It's going to be pretty cool. So I give you my good friend, Daniel Con Vetterlein. Thanks for coming, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me, Tracy. Daniel, tell us a bit uh, about uh, where you're from. Well, I'm from Germany, of course. We're not going to hold so, out against Which is yet. like the, pretty much the best country. <laughs> and because uh, last year we won 4-3 against Canada in ice hockey. I'm from, I'm, I'm, I'm from northern Germany, <laughs> which is a similar in climate to Canada as well. Yeah, sure it is. Yeah, sure. I, I love it quite yeah. a lot. Did the palm trees lose their, lose their leaves this year? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, that sounds terrible. Of course, yeah. They so, will grow back. So what actually brings you to the frozen plains of Canada, and, and, and why why would you be here in February of all times? Well, I always wanted to be in, Fe uh, in Canada in February. It's and not I was, a smart decision. I was invited by the DFO, by the Dead Fish Order, to come over <laughs> to speak. And you said yes. Yes, 
because I didn't know it was going to snow. Ah. Yes. So this is the dead fish order. This is the, this is the organization that you came to speak for. How well did it go? Well, I enjoyed it. I'm not sure the others did, but uh, I had some fun. I was outside cooking. Yeah, so. So was it well received? Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. There, were, there were like 65 people. Everybody seemed more or less happy. Cool. That's yeah. good. So was I. That's you're on a pretty, pretty prestigious list. The Dead Fish Order only brings in the best of the best from yeah. the world. Yeah, so. now they're trying something new with me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're keeping warm? Yeah. Are they keeping yeah. you hydrated? Yeah, very, very hydrated yeah. actually. Yeah, I, I can't complain at all. All right. So, uh, what would be the what would tell me what would be the first fish you ever kept? Well, the very first fish I ever kept uh, is that's 19 years ago. It was Corydoras trilineatus. Very cute one, very small one, beautiful little cory. Catfish. A catfish, of course. I only keep catfish in general. Is this is this because the pet store didn't sell proper fish? No, but catfish, especially the huge catfish, they feed on all the boring fish. Ah. Like you might know some. Must be a German thing. <laughs> so what actually got you hooked then on fish? Can't be the silly little cory. Well, it wasn't the cory, of course, but uh, the cory made me buy catfish book. And in, in this catfish book, I found a picture of Acanticus adonis, okay. a beautiful black fish with some white spots, elongated uh, caudal fins and caudal fin extensions, actually. And I was looking for this fish for almost two years. So I started when I was 10 years old. And when I was 12, I got my first specimen of this beautiful fish. And you're what, 15 now? Almost, yeah. I'm uh, <laughs> 28, actually. So I, I know that I look very young. That's my German genes. That's a good thing. It's going to keep you going for the years. Yeah, yeah. I'm only 29, but I don't look yeah, anymore. It's yeah. just like brothers, actually. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand that uh, you've, you've traveled a lot all over South America, but is, is there one yeah. place that you, you really like one over the other and why? Well, my definitely my most favorite place is Bolivia. All the places in Bolivia, because uh, I have a family down there in Bolivia. This was the first country I traveled to when I was 15, 15 or 16, somewhere in this range. And I stayed there for one whole year, and since you then... You went on a school exchange or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I went there, for, and I had to go to school officially, but mostly I was outside in the river looking for brown catfish, and I, I, I succeeded, so I had to Same go Same thing normal, a normal boy or, boy or kid would be doing anywhere yeah. they live, but you just happen to be in Bolivia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So why don't you go back and we, let, let's go and actually talk a bit more, you know, about your academic background because that's, yes. that's really the reason that you're, you're out and about and you're doing these talks and you're traveling the world and stuff that's continuing. But your academic background, some, some, you've got a lot of cool stuff there. Yeah. Well, uh, all that fish keeping and fish breeding also made me uh, get into the ichthyologist world, into you know, the systematics, into taxonomy and the, all this. Mm -hmm. So I decided to study biology first. And uh, yeah, this is actually what still got me hooked because uh, during my studies in biology, I found out way more about the fish than I knew before, of course. And I decided to do uh, my bachelor, my master, and also my PhD thesis about uh, lorry Okay, Those are fish? Yeah, the best fish. The sucker mouse catfish, they could go near glass. And they would even clean this glass, actually. Yeah, I got two in that tank, but yeah. uh, I think they eat poop. That's what they eat. Yeah, that's, some eat poop, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I understand you apparently have uh, other diversions beside fish. And those oh, yeah. are ones that are, are there, there's something seriously wrong with that, and you might want to curb that quickly. I'm happy with it, but I have to admit that I also like birds, and it doesn't even have to be uh, like water birds. I like well, everybody likes birds. birds. Yeah, they're delicious. I do. No, I like them when they're more or less alive. It's easier to take pictures of them when they're pretty half dead. But uh, I like I like birds a lot because after school, I did a voluntary year on the beautiful island of Norderney in Germany, northern Germany. So, and, uh, one year I worked with birds only. That was good. Good times. Good memories. <laughs> it was good. You know, you can go to the awesome. mall any day of the week and see little girls using their phone taking pictures of their lunch. Yeah. Birds. I took such a lens to take pictures of birds far away. You know, I keep finding that a lot of these, uh, our, our, our masters and some of the, the, the legends in the aquatic field, they, uh, they seem to keep growing up and they're getting older and they seem to turn their passions towards birds then. You know, I, I'm, we're getting kind of concerned yeah. already in your but, young age that you're already starting to focus no, on yeah. birds now. The, the thing is, I'm starting to be a legend already. 
might start calling you the Colonel. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Do you have any interest in actual women? Well, of course, yeah. As a German, I prefer blonde women. Like, huge blonde women with blue eyes. As everybody knows, because Huge of blonde women? Tall blonde women. Okay. With, with a huge character, yes. Okay. Do women like you? <laughs> well, with, so, with all this interest in birds? So far, I only made good experiences. Right. But uh, I'm happy to spread my number on this video afterwards. Okay, <laughs> the stats. <laughs> we'll have graphs and stuff that we'll add into the into the video. Uh, so with all this academic background and stuff, and all the studies that you've done, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, like the, the studies that you did. You, sh you you shared with me a presentation about about the lower carriers that really had a lot more stronger influence or um, influence about the, the the lip structures, and that's yeah. really what started. How did that come about? And Maybe go into a bit more detail for the viewers and stuff about, yeah. about why why that's so important and why because we watched that thing last night and you know I'm not a hardcore pleco guy I've kept a lot well, of yes, them and yes. stuff like that but uh, that passion that you showed in that video and, and and the excitement about the structures of things that people have overlooked for hundreds of years yeah. is what really resonated with me and I was actually interested in it as well not interested to the level of you because I don't like birds either but <laughs> maybe talk talk a little bit about that yeah. So what I'm actually doing is I'm studying the, the lower lip structures of the or so-called Sacramouse catfish. Mm -hmm. And I got into this because um, I'm taking a lot of pictures of my plecos at home. And uh, I have like 18 tanks running at the moment. So I, I'm taking pictures pretty much every day. And I see them on the glass, they're sucking on the glass, like from the left to the right. And even in the strongest currents, it's not, not a single problem for them to keep on the glass while they're feeding. And I watched this for years and then one day I had this this idea in my head, like, how are they actually able to do this? Because uh, everybody says, okay, they're only creating a vacuum, that's it, basta, nobody really cares about it. But I got way more into it, so I asked some friends to send me their dead fishes. I got hundreds of dead fishes, literally hundreds, and I started to cut uh, the lower lips out and, uh, yeah, research them. Under Beware, the women. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but it's only the lower lip. I can see the mail coming in now, fast and furious. <laughs> so I decided to cut the lower lips and investigate them under an SEM, a scanning electron microscope, mm -hmm. to look after the secondary and uh, tertiary hierarch hierarchical uh, level structures. So we have the Sacramento disc, which looks like this. Mm -hmm. We have the lower lip, a little bit smaller. And then on the lower lip, we have several small papillae, like small elongations. Mm -hmm. And even on those small elongations, we have another hierarchical level, which is uh, the so-called unculi. It, is, it looks like some small mushrooms sometimes. Mm -hmm. And using those small mushrooms, they're actually able to adhere to glass, to gravel, to stones, to wood, to whatever surface they want to be We on. used the reference yesterday, we were talking about them, and it was very similar to like in the reptile kingdom with the uh, geckos and their toe exactly. pads, how they can cling onto just surfaces that seem they shouldn't to. Yes. They are, it's very, very similar to geckos, so they have like five toes, but on those five toes so they have different, uh, like smaller structures, and those smaller structures combined makes it a huge, huge surface. Mm -hmm. So the contact zone is way bigger between the actual toe and the surface, and the same is happening in my geckos. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating that nobody's ever even considered looking at that. Everyone yes. just literally thought, like you said, vacuumed to the glass, and that was it, and they moved around. But you showed me some video about how they, they use the musculature within in each of these individual little structures yeah. and they can manipulate their mouth in extreme fast water that they can almost move themselves around and then you also showed me video about uh, how they're using their different fins like uh, yeah. uh, how what was the reference you it's, used it's, for that? It's very similar uh, to a Formula One uh, car Yes. so they have their uh, especially the pectoral and the ventral fins mm -hmm. and it just works like the uh, like the back wings on, a, on, on every sports car actually so the, the pressure of the water just pushes the fish to the surface and it's get it, it gets attached to the surface. That was really cool. I really enjoyed the presentation last night. Now, cheers. Cheers. Perfect timing, because uh, I understand in Germany, over all the discussions that we've had the past couple of days, that uh, in Germany, beer is actually the second cheapest beverage you can buy, yes. only beat out by water. Yeah, and this uh, is only because we have a law that there has to be one beverage being cheaper than the cheapest alcohol beverage. 
That's a really good law, though. Yes, so That's I invite everybody law. to come over to Germany. Yeah, every picture you showed me of your lab, every, yeah. <laughs> everywhere had beer, and everywhere there's a picture of beer. So in today's honor, we have to have beer with our presentation. So I'm going to ask you, through all your years of research, all these late hours at the lab, all the working with all these dead fish, and working with live fish and stuff with beer always present, uh, be honest, how much time have you tried spent trying to get fish to actually survive in an aquarium with beer instead of water? Not only survive, but thrive, because, you know, the first few tests <laughs> and the results are usually going to be tragic, but I'm sure being the, the connoisseur that you're, you're not going to let that beer go to waste anyways. No. Well, but as a scientist, of course, I have to try it at least once or twice, mm -hmm. and I might have done it, actually. <laughs> but uh, I normally prefer my fish in, uh, in ethanol, in formaldehyde, so way more alcohol than a beer. Yeah. Yeah, it's still almost the same taste. You don't think you've inhaled too much of the fumes from that stuff, eh? Well, some people say I did, but... It, did the bird passion come after inhaling all the fumes? Well, now you're mentioning it. It's yeah, that's the kind answer. of the same time, yeah. You figured it out. <laughs> Well, you told me a little bit about how many current, how many tanks you maintain. You also showed me pictures yesterday of a, of a, a bathtub that you kind of left in a hurry to come here, and the bathtub's got fish living in it. Yeah. And little yeah. tubs on the floor in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to revisit the girl question again? <laughs> <laughs> these are things that being married uh, for my second time and having kids and stuff. I know these are things that uh, I'm just not going to bring up with my wife. Well, I try. Doesn't mean I won't do them, but it's just something I'm not bringing up with my wife. <laughs> uh, people often talk about uh, bucket lists of things they want to do, and you're still really, really young. But from an aquatic standpoint, would you think there's anything that, like, with all this stuff that you've been working with, uh, with all the studies and these presentations and everything you've been doing with uh, the lip structures of the Loricarians, yeah. what's what would be on on Daniel's aquatic bucket list? What do you want to do? Well, that's one species I, I'm keeping at the moment, but uh, that's a species that has never ever been bred on the hobby because very, very few people are kept it at all. It's a Rhinolepis aspera. So my specimens are like this in size, but they grow up to 70 centimeters, like almost this. And they're just pitch black, totally pitch black. They don't have any pattern at all. Is it a Bolivian species? No, it's actually from uh, the south of Brazil and the north of Argentina. Okay. And uh, the interesting thing is, this is the only, so far, the only known species where uh, the spawning behavior was documented. And, uh, in we, the wild? In the wild, okay. in the wild, of course. And we know that those are migrating, and they produce up to 200,000 uh, egg cells. And this, of course, would be hilarious to uh, replicate once in the hobby. How do you anticipate being fish. able to read something that migrates? Cause with, with South That's, America, the biggest challenge we're facing right now is continuously is the these building of these hydro dams, these yeah. monstrous hydro dams, because the population of Brazil, which is the primary country in, in focus, keeps exploding, and they're going to need power. So yeah. they're going to keep building these hydro dams, and fish that are going to be migratory, but those are the first ones that are going to face challenges. Exactly. This is because uh, this is one of the reasons why we have to breed, especially those Rwanda lepis, because, well, in my, in my opinion at least, they're very rare and they're very hard to get, so I was waiting for mine for seven years. Then I got them by a German friend. And um, those will be the first species that will face extinction. Yeah. All the others, like many Psodacanticos, many Hypansisters, they're easy to breed in the, in the hobby. So we need some, some new challenges. Yeah. And I Concentrated think efforts on some certain ones, certain exactly, species. Yeah. That always, otherwise, they're gone for good and we won't get them back. No. Nope. Yeah. This isn't Jurassic then, Park. Then, it, then it's gone, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I loved having you here, my friend. I very much look forward to hearing about more adventures. Maybe one day we'll get on the field together. Yeah, we will, to Bolivia. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Cheers. <laughs>